Sheikh Uthman ibn Farouk has dedicated his career not only to Dawa, but also to reforming Islam. And those two tasks are related. If you present a westernized version of Islam to Americans, they're much more likely to accept Islam. But Sheikh Uthman's westernized revisions are upsetting to more traditional Muslims and to various defenders of Islam, and they're calling him out for what they regard as compromise and deception. One interesting French defender of Islam has gone into quite a bit of detail exposing Sheikh Uthman's lies about jizya, but to understand his response, we'll have to recap a discussion I had with Sheikh Uthman about jizya. So, quick recap. When I asked Sheikh Uthman about his tweet claiming that jizya should be imposed on all non-Muslims, he volunteered to explain jizya to me. According to Sheikh Uthman, jizya is simply payment for services in an Islamic state. The Islamic state provides various services to non-Muslims, so non-Muslims pay a service fee called jizya. Sheikh Uthman repeatedly compared jizya to paying taxes in the U.S. The U.S. government provides services. We pay for those services through taxes. When he said that, I quoted two passages that describe jizya as something that's supposed to humiliate non-Muslims. Muhammad said in Sahih al-Bukhari, My livelihood is under the shade of my spear, and he who disobeys my orders will be humiliated by paying jizya. And in Ibn Kathir's commentary on Surah 929, we read, Paying jizya is a sign of kufr and disgrace. Allah said, Until they pay the jizya, if they do not choose to embrace Islam, with willing submission in defeat and subservience, and feel themselves subdued, disgraced, humiliated, and belittled. Therefore, Muslims are not allowed to honor the people of Dimma or elevate them above Muslims, for they are miserable, disgraced, and humiliated. Sheikh Uthman reinterpreted all of this. He insisted that Ibn Kathir is only talking about non-Muslims who refuse to pay the jizya. If you agree to pay the jizya, you're not disgraced, humiliated, or belittled. But if you refuse to pay, the Islamic government will come after you, just as the U.S. government will come after you if you refuse to pay taxes. The Islamic government will force you to pay, and that's when you'll be humiliated. I responded by pointing out that this can't possibly be what Ibn Kathir was saying, because Ibn Kathir goes on to say, This is why the leader of the faithful, Umar bin al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, demanded his well-known conditions be met by the Christians, these conditions that ensured their continued humiliation, degradation, and disgrace. And Ibn Kathir then quotes a story about Umar imposing massively humiliating restrictions on Christians who paid the jizya willingly. They weren't humiliated because they refused to pay. They were humiliated even after they agreed to pay. In response, Sheikh Uthman used the weak hadith defense. He said that story about Umar is a weak hadith. I then stated the obvious, namely, that the soundness of the hadith is irrelevant because all we're trying to do is understand what Ibn Kathir is saying. And Ibn Kathir clearly uses this story about Umar to support his comments about jizya. Ibn Kathir takes the story about Umar as fact. Again, read what he says. This is why the leader of the faithful, Umar bin al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, demanded his well-known conditions be met by the Christians, these conditions that ensured their continued humiliation, degradation, and disgrace. Ibn Kathir obviously isn't saying that Christians are only humiliated if they refuse to pay the jizya, because the story he quotes is about Christians being humiliated after they agreed to pay the jizya. Apart from that, I pointed out that Ibn Kathir's disgraced, humiliated, and belittled commentary is meant to explain Allah's words and feel themselves subdued in Surah 9, verse 29. I quoted the verse to Sheikh Uthman. Notice, Allah commands his followers to fight the people of the book, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. 
you pay the jizya with willing submission and you feel yourself subdued. It doesn't say you pay the jizya with willing submission, but if you refuse, then you'll be subdued. Feeling yourself subdued is simply part of paying jizya. And what does it mean to feel yourself subdued? Disgraced, humiliated, and belittled. There is absolutely no way Ibn Kathir is saying what Sheikh Uthman claims he's saying. But if you're going to constantly twist the words of Allah and the words of Muhammad, you obviously won't have much of a problem twisting the words of Ibn Kathir. Sheikh Uthman is reinventing Islam here. So that's a recap. Sheikh Uthman's fans don't seem to care when he twists the words of Islam's greatest scholars. But other Muslims and non-Muslims have a problem with this. They don't like it when people like Sheikh Uthman misrepresent the words of Allah or the words of Muhammad or the words of Muslim scholars. A French self-described defender of Islam named Basil, who seems to be fairly popular, blasted Sheikh Uthman for pretending that jizya is simply payment for services and not also about humiliating the unbelievers. Basil is an interesting fellow. He's a guy who hates the West and believes that the West is conquering the world and that Islam is the only thing that can keep the West from conquering the world. But he believes that Islam is being infiltrated by Western values, which will take away its power to oppose the West. So he really doesn't like people like Sheikh Uthman corrupting and Westernizing Islam from within. Basil writes, Uthman ibn Farouk fooling Muslims again. Will this dude ever stop? David quotes a text from Ibn Kathir, Rules on Dhimmi by Umar. This kind of rules are well known, but Uthman acts like these rules were not implemented under Islamic law. He explains, and he's right, that he explains that Ibn Kathir is not implementing fiqh. One must go to books of fiqh. All right. But what book of fiqh? If I quote a book, he will say, no, not that one. So what book? What is the reliable book for His Majesty Uthman ibn Farouk? And problem is here for, here is the problem for Uthman ibn Farouk. He quoted right before a reliable book of fiqh, Zad al-Mustakni. Now we have a reliable book. He says one has to look at his videos. Well, no. Let's go to the book directly so we are sure this dude won't try to fool people again. We find in Zad al-Mustakni about the same rules that are in the text that Uthman rejected. The issue here is that Uthman acts like these rules were not implemented because the narration in Ibn Kathir is weak. And so his followers, the Muslims, are fooled. And Basil gives some examples from Zad al-Mustakni of non-Muslims being humiliated by paying jizya. Almost everything that David said is implemented. And even in the reliable book that Uthman mentioned 10 minutes before. The Muslims are fooled because Uthman acts like it was not implemented. He fools Muslims. But why? Why doing such a vile thing? And why so constantly? Basil gives some more examples of non-Muslims being humiliated by paying jizya. He continues, Oh, oh, what happened, Uthman? You don't know what is written in your books? You keep throwing Ibn Kathir and scholars under the bus to please the Islamophobes or the FBI? He says he has been called by the FBI. There is something wrong with this dude. His followers refuse to acknowledge the truth. They believe in Uthman like their deen was hanging to him. I must admit that Uthman is very good at giving the impression that he is learned and truthful and that he demolishes David. But all that is just appearances. Islam will not drop if Uthman ibn Farouk drops. Islam will not drop if David says the truth sometimes. Islam won't drop if the Dhimmis are humiliated or the Murtad killed or I don't know. It's only in your heads. You have to make your minds clear and stop trying to please the Kufar. This keeps happening over and over and over. Sheikh Uthman will say absolutely anything to escape an objection 
or criticism. His followers love it. They love it even if he completely distorts the Quran and the Hadith and the Tafsir. Other Muslims don't like it, but they seem to be in the minority. Non-Muslims don't like it either. So I raise an objection. I quote a Muslim source, Sheikh Uthman lies in order to escape the objection. And certain Muslims who otherwise don't like me and certain non-Muslims like Basil, who don't want Sheikh Uthman's lies spreading, end up saying, no, David is right here. Sheikh Uthman is lying. Why are they blasting Sheikh Uthman? You can't say it's because they just don't like him. They definitely don't like me, but they keep saying that I'm right. Given how much these guys despise me, and you can see from their other comments that they really, really despise me. Given how much these guys despise me, do you have any clue how difficult it must be for them to say David is right and the Muslim scholar is wrong? Basil seems genuinely confused about why Sheikh Uthman is doing this, and even more, how he keeps getting away with it. But it's actually pretty simple. Think about the various reasons someone might get into a relationship, a man and a woman, for instance. A man might get into a relationship with a woman because of love, or because of physical attraction, or because of intellectual attraction, or because of common interests, or for financial reasons, or for all kinds of other reasons and combinations of reasons. But some men get into relationships with women because they have an inner drive to control other people. Ladies, these are the kind of men you don't want to get involved with. The reverse is true as well. Men, you don't want to get involved with women who have an inner drive to control other people. The men and women who seek control over other people are the men and women who develop manipulation tactics that they use to control others. Good so far? Okay. Now, for some people, religion is a tool for establishing and maintaining manipulative control over others. I'm sure we're all familiar with this. There are people in every religion who use religion as a tool for establishing and maintaining manipulative control over others. These people use manipulation tactics to gain psychological control over their followers. Once they have psychological control over their followers, they can say almost anything their followers won't question them. Fortunately, there are a limited number of manipulation tactics. Once you understand what they are, and you can spot them, you can expose the manipulators and their tactics. The cool part is that manipulators generally only have a handful of go-to tactics, three to five tools in their tool belt. When you eventually recognize and begin to counter those tactics so that the manipulators lose their source of control, they start to panic because they can't stand not being in control. I know you don't trust me on much, Basil, but you've admitted that I'm right sometimes, so trust me on this one. There aren't many things in life that are more fun than watching a narcissistic, psychologically abusive control freak start to lose control. It is a glorious sight to behold. Get ready for the Sheikh Uthman Show.